Hello friends, hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving and welcome back to Currently Workshopping, a show where we work through the perils and frisson of being alive together. I'm your host Cece and this week I'm taking a hard look at the law schools ceremoniously, unceremoniously, announcing their withdrawal from the one and only US News and World Report rankings. One thing about me is I really am like all the other applicants in that I pretty much did make my law school decision based on rankings. Was it unnuanced of me? Absolutely. Did it still serve me? Also, absolutely. And that's what I want to get into today. Why the U.S. News and World Report, well, that's actually really too long to say, uh, U.S. Newer, let's say U.S. Newer, why the U.S. Newer law school rankings have such a chokehold on legal education and the legal industry more generally. I'll discuss how every element of the process of becoming a lawyer primes you to accept rules and rankings, which does partially explain our affinity for rankings like U.S. Newer. And then I'll go into an overview of the U.S. Newer methodology and why I think that despite all the pomp and circumstance, these schools withdrawing from the rankings really doesn't matter at all. It's just good PR for a lot of them. Bark without bite. But before we get into it, I want to thank Sarah Eddie B and Irvin for leaving reviews on Apple Podcasts. I have to admit that I always do ask myself, like, who asked? Who cares? When I post these episodes. So it's beyond heartening to see that there are, in fact, other people on the other end of the line who do care, even if they may not have asked. I've also gotten some comments about talking slower, so I will endeavor to talk a little bit slower from now on, but I am sorry if I don't talk as slowly as the other podcasters. It actually drives me crazy how slowly some podcasters talk, so I try to be a bit speedier with my solo episodes at the very least, but let me know if I'm still talking too quickly and I'll try to find a happy in-between. And now, on with the show. This week, I want to talk about the niche but explosive news that some law schools, including Yale, Harvard, Columbia, Berkeley, and Georgetown, have withdrawn from the U.S. News & World Report rankings, the U.S. Newer rankings. This probably seems so mundane if you're not a law student or a lawyer, but it actually sent shockwaves through the legal community because, well, we tend to be prestige obsessed and nothing is more prestigious than some made up rankings by third party to really get our competitive spirits going. Like law students and lawyers, including myself, love rankings. Maybe not that they would admit, but I do suspect an awareness and vague obsession with rankings and performance undergirding all pre-law and law students. Let's take a closer look at the makeup of those folks. If you're interested in law school, you're likely interested in the law, or more generally, rules. Now, this could be an interest in rules because you want to change them, or break them, or just follow them, but the commonality is still this focus on rules. Can you shoot someone who's trespassing on your property? Can you sue a police officer who hurts you while arresting you? These are all questions of rules, some more complex than others in terms of analysis, but nonetheless rules. And every part of the law school admissions process and 1L curriculum reinforces this obsession with rules. What do you have to take, at least right now, to get into law school? A standardized test, like the LSAT or GRE. And what is a standardized test? Yes, yeah, some test of knowledge, but also a test of rules. Particularly for the LSAT, I can't really speak to the GRE because I didn't take it, but for the LSAT, the core of substance for the test is learning how to manipulate if-then statements. And what is an if-then statement if not a rule? If X is true, then Y follows. That's a rule. And so much of the test is about other rules that follow from that first if-then rule. And that's not even to bring up the logic games part of the LSAT, which again is a bunch of rules. If Amy is next to Casey, then Casey is not next to David. Eric must either be first or last. Barry cannot be next to David. Those are just example prompts that a logic game would have. And then the questions are all about what's possible or impossible from both set of rules. Even from a non-substantive perspective, I remember reading the prep books and all of them telling me that I needed to learn the rules of the test, what the test makers are trying to look for. A good fourth of studying for the LSAT was just learning how to eliminate answers so that there was only one left. It was rarely about identifying the one correct answer. It was about eliminating all the obviously wrong ones so that you could answer the question really quickly and move on to the next question. The section time limits on the LSAT alone aren't really representative of anything in legal practice. 
which is why the exam as a whole, while I did enjoy studying for it in a kind of weird way, the exam still doesn't really make sense to me in terms of admissions. And it's great that the ABA has recommended that law schools do away with the requirement altogether, because I don't know where the idea came from that how you did on the LSAT was going to be an indication of how well you were going to do in law school, because if that's the case, I am a living example that you can do great on the LSAT and still get pretty average grades in law school. But Okay, the point is that the LSAT or the GRE already condition you to have learned rules in preparation for law school, and the admissions process itself is fairly straightforward. Ironically, due to how the U.S. New York ranks law schools, in a weird chicken-egg dilemma, 90% of law school admissions can be determined by GPA and LSAT score, or now GRE. Again, this is a pretty clear rule. Sure, there are exceptions, and applicants spend a good portion of their application cycle obsessing over whether they're going to be the exception but by and large, this is another pretty clear rule. GPA and standardized test score will largely determine admissions. I always wonder if law school admissions offices know just how rule-seeking their applicants are, and if they do know, if they would really continue operating in the same way. I'm not sure what forum law school applicants use nowadays, maybe Reddit, but when I was applying, the top law schools forum, the TLS forums for short, was the place to go for all your obsessive and anxious tendencies related to the LSAT and law school. Like, we were crazy. I'm already really crazy when it comes to anxiety checking and obsessive behaviors, but TLS me was like the evolved form of me. We would obsessively check our status checkers, comment on whether like under review on January 14th meant that we were going to get rejected or accepted, just really a lot of trying to read tea leaves. I even ended up dating someone from TLS for a short period of time, which if you're curious about, I'll talk about on Patreon this week. So head over there if you want to hear my top law schools forum love story. Um, sort of. We, we obviously broke up. And in terms of just how reading tea leaves applicants get, I was talking to an applicant this cycle and he told me that the subreddit discovered that if your street address in a portal changed abbreviations to full words, like instead of ST, it becomes street, it was an indication that you were accepted that day. I mean, first of all, excellent sleuthing. But second of all, this is the epitome of looking for rules, right? If address changes from abbreviations to full words, then accepted. The contrapositive being, if not accepted, then your address won't have changed that day. And finally, law school, particularly the 1L curriculum, primarily focuses on rules. You learn what the elements of negligence are, and if one of those elements isn't met, then the case gets thrown out. That's a rule. You learn that if you live openly and notoriously on property that isn't yours for seven years, that's adverse possession and now you own that part of land. That's a rule. You learn that if you don't serve someone that you're suing within, I don't know, some days of filing that lawsuit in federal court, then the action gets dismissed. That, you guessed, is a rule. All throughout law school, I was struck by how much everyone sought out rules, myself included. How should we best dress for class? When should we start studying for finals? Or as they call it in law school parlance, outlining. What grades do we need for a federal clerkship? It was like we didn't know how to be. And the pretty straightforward rules that were part of the initial application process, namely the LSAT and GPA and reading the status checker tea leaves, no longer existed. But we still craved those straightforward rules, those rules that had that level of certainty. They didn't exist, but it doesn't mean that we stopped looking for them. We were practically conditioned to be obsessed with and look for rules, you know? And I will admit that rules are useful. Rules help you be comfortable, figure out how to be. Rules offer structure, certainty. For myself, I know that the one rule I need to know before going anywhere is the dress code and the weather. For some reason, if I know how to dress, if I know that rule, I always end up feeling way more confident at whatever event I'm at, even if there are times that I'm standing in a corner by myself with no one talking to me, which Yes, does happen. And I know it's a mindset thing. I know that I could also not be wearing proper attire and standing in a corner by myself feeling confident, but I just, I just don't have that in me, okay? I am not that strong, that cool, that confident. I need my safety blanket. That's the dress code. So 
rules can help us feel safe, but if we have rules, it also means that there is probably a way to rank compliance with the rules, adherence to the rules, right? For the LSAT, you can learn the rules of the test, but then you get a literal score on how well you applied the rules out of 180. You get grades in classes that supposedly demonstrate how well you know and applied the legal rules you learned in class. And if you get really great grades, like the top grades at the top schools, then you graduate with Latin honors and maybe Maybe even wind up with a Supreme Court clerkship, the ultimate indicator that you're a master of the rules. And I think this is the trap that law schools have fallen into with the U.S. News and World Report. For applicants, the U.S. newer and its rules, whatever those rules are, represent safety. Like if you just go to a school that's ranked such and such, your future will be okay. And for employers like law firms and judges and companies, the U.S. newer and its rules also represent safety. Safety in hiring decision. Hiring employees will always be a bit of a gamble, but the thinking is that if they recruit from only the top schools, those rankings are an acceptable proxy for student quality, which isn't always true, but whatever. At the end of the day, rankings are a mental shortcut that we like to take because actually calculating things out for ourselves, looking at the data, figuring out our own criteria, weighing the factors, takes effort, and a lot of mental effort at that. I always laugh a little to myself when people ask me about what interviewers look for in applicants because the truth of the matter is that interviewers are often very busy and distracted, and interviewing applicants is priority number 46 on their list. Frequently, it was obvious to me that interviewers were looking at my resume for the first time when they sat down in front of me. Of course, some interviewers who are interviewing for people in their own team might approach it differently because they do have stakes in an interview, right? Like they do want to hire the right person for working with them. But for the most part, interviews are conducted by people for whom interviewing is an obligation and something that they would honestly rather rely on proxies like school ranking or GPA or prestige rather than craft perfectly tailored in-depth questions to every interviewee. And I get that. I have been there. I would have to force myself to put an alert 15 minutes before interviews I had to conduct to make sure that I did look at their resume and highlighted a few points that I wanted them to talk about. And it sounds simple because it's not really that hard, but at the same time, interviewers don't get paid to interview, and it's not part of the job description. In fact, interviewing takes away from time doing one's actual job, and it can be easy to think of interviewing as a burden rather than an opportunity to advance good company culture or build a good team or whatever. So it really is appealing to use proxies like school ranking or class ranking instead of really evaluating the person. But that begs the question. Is the U.S. News and World Report even a good proxy to use? The U.S. News and World Report started ranking schools in 1983, starting with colleges. It began ranking law schools annually starting in 1990, and its ranking is where the term T14 or top 14 comes from. Because the composition of the law schools ranked in the top 14 is fairly static, although there are, of course, movement within the T14 and also at the edge of the T14. Most notably for the 2023 rankings, for example, Harvard fell to fourth and was replaced by UChicago, which I'm sure has led to a bevy of jokes by pre-law and law students alike. To be honest, when I got asked what I think about this demotion, I am kind of bothered because who am I kidding? <laughs> Your girl is a recovering prestige addict. But I will say that after having delved more into the U.S. News and World Report's methodology for ranking, the demotion to fourth and really much of the rankings at all don't make that much sense to me. This is because perceived prestige, I kid you not, accounts for 40% of the rankings. That's right, the U.S. newer calls it quality assessment, but it basically sends a survey to two groups of people. First group is composed of law school deans, deans of academic affairs, chairs of faculty appointments, and most recently tenured faculty members who will rate the school from one to five, marking, I don't know, for schools they don't know well enough to evaluate. If you've watched my YouTube video about how where you go to law school matters, you'll know that academia already has a crazy bias towards the top ranked schools. 11% of law professors in the US are HLS grads. Over a thousand YLS alumni currently teach in the US and worldwide law schools, which is wild to think because the Yale Law School class size is like less than 200, and seven of the deans of T14 schools are 
Yale Law School grads. How's that for overrepresentation, huh? So if you survey legal academics and their assessments are given a whopping 25% weight in the overall rankings, the largest weighting for any one factor, and legal academics disproportionately come from not even the top schools in general, but like the top three, four schools, is it any surprise that the law school rankings perpetuate themselves and the underlying prestige obsession of the legal community year after year, especially in legal academia? Do you really think that those 11% of law professors in the U.S. who are HLS grads are going to rate, say, Seton Hall higher than Harvard, their alma mater, if they even know enough about Seton Hall's program to score it at all? It's not like the U.S. newer requires assessors to study up on all, what, 196 law schools and their educational offerings. The assessors are probably filling out during a lunch break in an attempt to up the rank of whatever institution they're teaching at so that they can be better positioned for their own journey through prestige-obsessed academia. And this actually makes me mad because one of the best attorneys I know, also a big law partner, is a Seton Hall grad. And I know he makes it a point to interview Seton Hall law students every year, which I'm sure the firm only does because he is a partner there. Firms that don't have partners who are graduates of certain law schools just won't recruit at those schools generally, which is a bummer because there are people who would be amazing lawyers at every institution. And the second group that the U.S. newer sends these like thinly veiled prestige assessments to are lawyers and judges. This comprises 15% of the overall ranking, so weighted less than the legal academics, even though I would arguably contend that, I don't know, people working as practicing attorneys and judges might actually be better suited to judging the caliber of law schools from a practical and like more institutionally diverse perspective. I don't know who these legal professionals and judges are that U.S. Newer sends these surveys to, but legal academia is so skewed towards the top four schools that this like practicing lawyers and judges group pretty much has to be a better representation of legal practice at large and not just the chosen few from a handful of top law schools. To really put it into perspective, another factor that the U.S. Newer considers placement success, which is a combination of employment rates, bar passage rate, and debt incurred from law school, accounts for 26% of the rankings. These three factors together barely count more than the quality assessment score from the legal academics alone. Employment rate only accounts for 18% of the rankings, which is funny because shouldn't the point of law school be to, I don't know find employment as a lawyer. So let's recap this. Employment rate is 18% of the rankings and prestige, I'm sorry, quality assessment is 40%. Makes sense. And that's not even bringing in the latent prestige bias of another factor, selectivity. Selectivity makes up a whopping 21% of the rankings, and it is composed of median LSAT or GRE score, median undergrad GPA, and acceptance rate. This is the reason why law school admissions is like 90% determined by GPA and LSAT or GRE, because increasing selectivity alone boosts 21% of the law school's rankings. It's clearly the easiest and fastest growth hack in all of this, because why pour more resources into job placement for students when you could just increase the median numbers of your admits? Like, guys, the US newer ranking methodology is actually insane. I'm not surprised at all that schools wanted to protest the rankings because the methodology does place outsized weight on prestige, which inherently reinforces the status quo. If anything, the takeaway from the US newer is that we should all go to UC Irvine because it's managed to build prestige to 37th despite operating for less than 15 years. That's actually really impressive, especially in an industry so enamored with tradition and precedent and other old things. But what's really unclear to me about these schools announcing that they're withdrawing from the U.S. newer rankings is whether that will even matter. I'm not really sure it will because, like I mentioned, 40% of the rankings is based on prestige as gathered by survey responses from legal academics and lawyers, and 21% of the rankings is determined by GPA, standardized testing, and selectivity, which are public information year after year, as is employment rate and bar passage rate, which together account for another 21% of the rankings. So just from those public or survey data, you have 82% of the rankings already. The U.S. newer has even stated that it plans on continuing to rank all of the law schools, even those that have withdrawn, and because at least 82% of the ranking factors are just out there in the world already, it seems like the withdrawals won't mean much. A New York Times article interviewed some law school deans and professors who commented that even though the rankings are flawed, they provide information to students and employers, and also serve as 
marketing, which is valuable. The Times article goes on to cite an economics paper, which found that going to a T14 school didn't appear to have any impact on bar passage, but attending a T14 school did have a substantial signaling effect for clerkships and big law firms, basically law schools as proxies for competence or success or whatever else the judges and big law firms look for. And while it's easy for schools like Yale, who has consistently been ranked first, to withdraw from the rankings, lower ranked schools don't exactly have that same luxury and also appreciate the free marketing of the rankings. And free marketing likely impacts perceived prestige, which factors into the US newer rankings and on and on, and it becomes this like weird chicken egg situation. The problem with rankings is that, like capitalism, it self perpetuates, draws everyone around it into itself. You can say you're withdrawing from the game of rankings, but if everyone around you is still playing, still acting with an eye towards the game, like, what choice do you have and what difference does it make? Especially if you're not one of the top ranked schools already. Like sure, withdrawing might be a great show of support for your values and all that, but can you really afford to withdraw from the rankings? And if you do, you open yourself up to criticism that you're withdrawing only because you were quote unquote losing, which is, I don't know, almost harder for me to hear sometimes than staying in the game and being called a sellout. Like, okay, sure, I'm selling out, but I'm selling out with a higher ranking at least, or prestige or money or what have you. It is so tempting, so, so tempting when I'm getting attacked for something or other to just throw up my hand, say, screw it, might as well be as lame or terrible or evil as someone contends that I am, and then just laugh all the way to the bank. This is kind of the classic prisoner's dilemma, right? In an ideal world, none of the schools would participate in the rankings and we could all just focus on our quality legal education. But when the US NOR forces schools into its game, all of a sudden the winning situation is to defect for your own gain. So I do question whether these few schools pulling out will do anything because the US NOR has stated that they would continue publishing the rankings anyway. Like capitalism, rankings are a game that the US NOR will not let law schools out from. So all this back and forth and formal mic drops seem great, but also for what, you know? The insidious thing about prestige is that it's like a virus self-replicating. You can try to escape it, but it's sheer virality is the problem. And some of the schools who announced that they were withdrawing, like Yale, Harvard, Stanford, realistically just won't feel much of the pain of withdrawing. Legal academics will still regard the institutions highly, lawyers in the industry will also likely still regard them highly and rate them highly, and in the end, nothing really has changed. And that's it for this time. I hope you enjoyed this episode and are armed with new insight as the law school application cycle really ramps up. I've linked all references in the show notes below, as well as my website, where you can find all of my socials and other projects. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate your taking the time to do the Holy Trinity, rate, review, and subscribe, and I'll do a shout out on next week's episode. See you then.